Good day. Um, thank you again for inviting me in your places as we uh, look at Psalm 118 in the continuing sermon series, The Path to Life. Uh, you might be seeing this video with some sort of clouding around it. Uh, not sure what I've done to my camera settings, but uh, uh, really not sure how to fix that right now. So we're going to continue with the way you're seeing it now and hopefully it doesn't bother you too much. It looks a little bit of a sort of a fuzz on the edge of the, of, the, of the image. But I think you can see me right here in the middle. I thank you for your patience. I'll try and sort that out as soon as I can. Why don't we start? Someone once said, quote, we get all bent out of shape about self-identity and stuff. Who am I and my worth, my esteem, and my value, and all of that, end quote. Now, CNBC... Uh, international Ministry in a blog dated January 9th, 2023, presented the five big questions of life. I wonder if you know what those are. Well, here they are. No specific order. We start with the big question, where did I come from? Of course, that's a question of origins. Then we have, who am I? A question of identity. Why am I here? A question of purpose. And how should we live? A question of morality. And where am I going? That's the question of our destiny. Now, if you were to search for the meaning of life in your favorite web browser like I did, you might end up with 79 million hits or 79 million results. Why don't, why don't we boil these down to a few examples, a few examples of folks, uh, how they defined uh, the meaning of life. We'll start with Mark Twain, who said concerning the meaning of life, quote, when we remember we are all mad, that's what he said, the mysteries disappear and life stands explained. Robert Louis Stevenson said, quote, to be what we are and to become what we are capable of becoming is the only end to life. A fellow by the name of George Herbert, I'm not sure who that is, said, quote, life is half spent before we know it, before we know what it is. Now, I think we could go on for on and on for 79 million more times, it appears. So why don't we end with a quote from uh, deceased avowed atheist and comedian George Carlin who said, just when I discovered the meaning of life, they changed it. You know what, I think we can, agree, we can agree along with CNBC International that we cannot really truly find the meaning of life on the internet. Arthur, author John Reinhardt said, quote, we all want to know who we are. We seek and search and try to, quote, unquote, find ourselves. You know, maybe folks were asking the wrong questions. Instead of asking, for example, who am I? Maybe we should ask what Pastor John Piper asked his congregation one time. Whose am I? Whose am I? Now that seems a better question as we look around our culture and the wider church as well, with so many struggling with identity and challenges to those things as well. You know, struggling with the big five questions. The questions of origin and identity and purpose and morality and identity and destiny. Now, atheist and comedian, now deceased, George Carlin, may have been right in a really strange and weird way when he, he said what he said. Because people and Christians included today might be able to say with Carlin, just when I discovered the meaning of life, they changed it. Well, let's get at it in a minute here, but let's read the scripture for today, which we find in Psalm 119, uh, starting in verse 129 and down to 136. Psalm 119, verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise, and let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from, my, from man's oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant, and teach me your statutes. And my eyes shed streams of tears, because people do not keep your law. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord and God, we thank you so much for this time to be together in this format, even with the cloudy edges. We know that your word is not cloudy. We know it is clear, and it teaches and molds and shapes us to become like your son, Jesus. So we commit this time to you, Lord. 
Help us to understand the word and the text today. Help us also live it out and put it into practice in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are continuing along with the psalmist prayer to God because that's what this is. Psalm 119 is a prayer to God. And that's the first point we could make here beginning with this, um, with this text. We have discovered that the psalmist prayed. Now this is not something unusual or foreign, of course, to the word of God. And let me just share some examples that we have uh, from the word of God itself. We see the prophet Samuel recording the prayer of adoration and praise to God of his mother Hannah in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. We can go to the New Testament. We find the Apostle Paul recorded many of his prayers in his letters. The Apostle Paul recorded his prayer for wisdom for the Ephesian church. He prayed for the wisdom that God would give them to, to continue on. And, and we find that in Ephesians 1, chapter chapter. Ephesians chapter 1, pardon me, verse 15 to 20. And one last example from the Lord himself. Uh, hours uh, from his crucifixion prayed a prayer of surrender and obedience to his Father in heaven in the Garden of Gethsemane. We find that in Matthew chapter 6, 38 to 41. So from Genesis to Revelation, prayer is not only normative in the lives of the people of God, but as the Apostle Paul said to the church in Philippi, prayer is essential in the lives of the people of God. There, Paul saying to the Philippian church, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be uh, made known to God, and the peace of God, will, will, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Je Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And as we've discovered in our examination of Psalm 119 along the way, the context that the psalmist lived in had its share of trials and tribulations. The psalmist had his enemies more than willing to accuse him falsely. As we see here in the stanza where the psalmist prayed that God would redeem me from man's oppression, verse 134, that God would deliver him from harm and evil. Indeed, prayer was essential for the psalmist of Psalm 119, as it is for you and me today, and we should be wise to remember this. So as we look at this uh, stanza from a bird's eye view, we find the psalmist describes what we can call here the benefits of God's word. And as we do that, as we look at this a little closer, we need to keep in mind an important feature of Psalm 119, that the word of God is a reflection of the character and nature of God. God, who inspired the psalmist by his Holy by his Spirit to produce what we call Psalm 119, thereby God's revelation of himself. It would not be inaccurate to say that our relationship then with God has its benefits, and they are reflected in his inspired word to us. For example, verse 129, we, uh, A, at the beginning there, we have this statement, your testimonies are wonderful, and the question is, Whose testimonies are wonderful? Well, the word of God from Genesis to Revelation is God's record of his acts in history, which in turn reveal the nature of God and all of his perfection and glory. We go back to the time of the Exodus. Israel had just crossed over the, the Red Sea. It was dry when they crossed over. And now uh, we find this after God had destroyed Pharaoh's armies they're on the other side of the Red Sea. And we have Moses' song recorded for us in Exodus chapter 15, where Moses said, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? That's verse 11 of Exodus 15. And the question is, indeed. And now this is rhetorical, of course. The God who was with Israel at the Red Sea is the same one described by the psalmist in Psalm 77, 14, who said, You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. So the word of God, my friends, by the divine inspiration, worked powerfully in the psalmist's soul, deep within the inner self, deep within that part of a person that feels and wills and desires and thinks. The word of God was planted deep, deep, deep within the soul, 
of the psalmist. We see that the psalmist, a few verses earlier, above this stanza, had said, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. And even further back, the psalmist said, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Verse 103. And now this brings a question to you all, to all of us. Can you say this about the word of God today in your life? Is it more precious to you than your RSPs and your mutual funds? More precious than money or gold or the car or the vacation? More precious than your entertainment? Does the word of God reside deep in your soul or does it barely skim the surface? You know, it's a mile wide and an inch deep. The psalmist prayed, Consider how I love your precepts at verse 159. The word of God, my friends, is a benefit for it finds a home deep in our souls, displacing all other temporal and worldly things. Another benefit of the word of God, the psalmist states here in verse 130, where he said, the unfolding of your word gives light. King David described the word of God as perfect in Psalm 1917. Perfect to reviving the soul. Our psalmist had also said, Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. That was verse 105. But here's the point then, folks. The psalmist used a word picture here at 105 to describe how the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, illuminates God's truth. And this is the benefit that King David refers to in his Psalm 19 that our psalmist here in verse 130 referred to, it imparts understanding to the simple, making wise the simple in Psalm 19.7. And the meaning of the word simple here has, can mean a reference to someone lacking intelligence or someone who is inexperienced in life, say like a youth. But I need, we need to keep in mind that we all start in our walk with Christ, as the Apostle Paul said, as infants in Christ. He said this to the Corinthian church in chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. And that was the problem in that church, is that they hadn't continued, but they can pass drinking milk. They were not on solid food. Paul had reminded them back in chapter 2, as he reminds us today of that letter to Corinth, that first letter, he reminded them that they had received not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God and that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. So with this in mind, we go back to our stanza. The Word of God finds a home deep in our souls. As the psalmist said, your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. Verse 129. The Spirit of God, through the Word of God, gives understanding of God's truth. It imparts wisdom. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the symbol, verse 130. And now we turn our attention, my friends, to verse 131. We encounter a metaphor. The psalmist said, I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Of course, the metaphor being, I open my mouth and pant. Now, this might sound familiar to some of us uh, who've been around a little while. There's a, a hymn out there with the title, As a Deer Pants for Water. And that hymn was based on Psalm 42, verse 1 and 2, where we read, As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Well, I think the point is made. The psalmist has expressed, had expressed his satisfaction as God's word refreshes the godly person. The word of God is a great benefit to the psalmist, as it is for you and me today. Now, as we turn our attention to the final four verses of the stanza, the psalmist now prayed for God's blessing. In verse 132, he said, Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. One commentator speaking of this verse said, God's blessings bring grace. It had directed the psalmist and protected him from sin and from his adversaries. Yes, the psalmist, as we look at this stanza, had his adversaries, for he prayed that, they would, that God would redeem me from man's oppression, verse 134. Of course, the psalmist also struggled with doubts and anxiety in, a contest, in his context, and no wonder, because he prays, make your face shine upon your servant. He was asking 
for the presence of God. Yes, the psalmist was a sinner who had received the forgiveness of God. And then he prayed, let no iniquity get dominion over me, or as the NIV in its translation puts it, let no sin rule in me. And this is at verse 133. Yes, the psalmist had placed his full trust in the word of God, so he asks that God would teach him his statutes. Verse 135. Of course, the psalmist walked in the wisdom of God's word. Why? So that he would keep the precepts of God. Psalm, verse 134b. And yes, the psalmist had gained understanding of, God, of who God is, who he was in the relationship with God, where he was going in his life, his place in the world of his day. So one could say that the word of God had answered those questions that we had talked about earlier, questions of origin, identity, purpose, morality, and destiny. So as we ponder the relationship the psalmist had with God, how his, relation, how his relationship with God impacted his life day in and day out. As we ponder all this and more, we find ourselves, you and I, in a context long removed from the days of Psalm 119, a 21st century context that brings its own cultural and societal issues and matters, a culture of 21st century opinions and ideas. And all these things rubs up against an abundance of political and religious and philosophical ideologies. My friends, for those who profess to be Christian, facing challenges from without the church, and especially even from within the church, the question that rises to the surface really does encompass all five, pardon me, of all the, of the five big questions of life. And the question is this, what does it mean to be a Christian in the 21st century. What does it mean to be a Christian in the 21st century? Now that's an enormous, gigantic, large question. And any of the answers that we might come up with will have an enormous, gigantic impact on you and I and the body of Christ today. But one wonders, one wonders, is there anyone willing in the church anymore to take this question on? It's interesting today how many divisions have found their way into the church. Denominations and churches and pastors and believers debating the hot button issues of the culture and the church. And for some reason, we have forgotten the answer pretty much is right at our fingerprints. And you ask where that might be? Well, it's right at the Word of God, is it not? Is it not the Word of God where we find the answers to all these questions that we are dealing with in our culture today? We forget so quickly, don't we, in the heat of our debates, what Jesus said to Satan about the Word of God during his 40 days of temptation in the desert. He said to Satan, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. And let's not forget what the Apostle Paul said to his dear friend Timothy regarding the Word of God. Paul said, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that you and I may be complete and equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16. But the question remains, doesn't it? What does it mean to be a Christian in the 21st century? Well, it's a huge question. So we can't be comprehensive today, but it's at its fundamental level to be a Christian in our context is no different than in the culture and context of the early church. The point is this. Friends, listen to this and hear this. The culture does not define what it means to be a Christian. Denominations and churches and pastors and believers in a way do not define what it means to be a Christian. So what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, at a basic fundamental level, a Christian is someone who receives Christ. In basic biblical terms, a Christian is someone who accepts God's gift of grace and salvation. And the key phrase there is gift of grace. For one to receive Christ requires no down payment, no money, no works, no nothing on our part, no merit of our own. For Paul reminded the Ephesian church, 
For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. My friends, to receive Christ, you and I bring nothing to the plate but our sin. This means acknowledging and being honest that we are unable to save ourselves from the wrath of God based on our own good works. We are born, as the Apostle Paul said to the Colossians, dead in our trespasses. Dead in our trespasses. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. There is nothing we can do, not even our good works and our kindness and our love, nothing to be accepted by a holy and just God. Only Jesus' work on the cross is a satisfactory atonement for our sins. And unless one accepts God's free gift of salvation, we then are not Christians. And it starts by repentance, doesn't it? Recognizing that we are in rebellion against a holy and just God. That we do deserve the full wrath of God. It is our confession of this condition, my friends. And by placing our full trust in the finished work of Christ, on the cross for our sin, and acknowledging Christ as our Savior, that we receive imputed to us the righteousness of Christ, and then, and only then, can we call ourselves Christians. Our full trust includes, my friends, not only that, but it includes our full obedience to the Lordship of Christ. This means every part of our lives is subject to Christ. This is what faith in Christ means, dear ones. That we trust Christ will always do what is in the best interest of our lives, no matter what happens or how we feel. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means we receive Christ and we obey him in every area of our lives. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means we desire to imitate Christ and live by his word. In a culture that's struggling with the meaning of life, even within the church, a Christian knows that the answer is found in only one place and it's the word of God. Not in some self-help book, not in some principle that some person created, not some program in a church. It is only, only found in the Word of God. A Christian knows they can't live the Christian life without the Word of God. And the Word of God is what the mind and the heart and the soul needs to navigate a world of opinions and struggles and trials and tribulations. The Word of God is what the Christian needs to become more and more like Christ more and more like Christ. The Word of God is where God speaks to the Christian. You want to hear from God? Open up your Bible. He speaks to you. The Word of God is the road map in an ever-changing culture. And the Christian is encouraged and warned to abide in the Word of God. Apostle John said this, Everyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. What does it mean to be a Christian in the 21st century? A Christian is one who receives Christ. A Christian is one who lives by the word of God. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this message. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Shalom.